Actually, I chose this because I think uh, in all of us there's a touch of cowardice, and I have a significant amount of it myself. Unlike a previous presenter, I gave in as Director of Medical Services because I could not stand um, what was going on around me, and I could not stand the cost it was going to be to actually make a difference. Um, but I'll use what I call the rule of three, and those that you went to the University of New South Wales might remember Professor Huckstep, who only died a couple of years ago. But he used to teach us that you needed to know three things about everything, the three most important things. And if you knew those three most important things, you could generally come up with the solution, which usually involved another three important things to do. Um, we seem lost there. Wait a I'll press the forward. Shall I just press that one? Uh, maybe Perfect, good. Now, I'm not a pessimist. I might be a coward, but I'm not a pessimist. But this I wrote this in an article I wrote for the Independent Australia. I'm in awe of the technological, pharmacological and public health advances we've made in the health in la over the last 50 years, which is a period I've practiced and trained. I could give many examples such as better immunisation, improved eye surgery, better cardiovascular disease management, improved and joint replacement, better cancer service and less invasive body imaging. But we have not made the same advances in our attitude to ethics and professionalism. We've left that behind. And those heroes of mine, like um, the famous people that taught us in medicine years ago, and, and in particular the, uh, the professor whose quote is up um, from yeah, Sir William Osler. Uh, th those things have been forgotten, and, and we forget history at our peril. Um, but the, the idea of the rule of threes is essentially this. To, to have a fire, you need three things. And you won't have a fire unless you have all of them. You have to have fuel, you have to have oxygen, and an ignition source. And that is a simple summary of the rule of threes. So I'm going to talk to you in simple terms, in a simple coward. Cowardice is a trait wherein fear and excess self-concern override doing or saying what is right. Good and of help to others or oneself in a time of need. It is the opposite of courage. As a label, cowardice indicates a failure of character in the face of challenge. In essence, it is inaction. I feel deeply that at times, in my time as a doctor and, and particularly as a medical administrator, I actually didn't act when I should have. Cowardice, therefore, there's only three things that you need to know about it. It's a lack of courage. It's an absence of courage. You won't face a challenge that's right in front of you. It's easy to walk away. It involves some danger or difficulty for yourself. It involves some opposition to yourself. It involves pain. It is an unpleasant experience. So my recent experience as a director of medical services for two years, I'd had a long career in academia and intensive care and anaesthesia. And I was one of the intensivists that weren't so popular because I actually liked surgeons. They're like puppy dogs. They always want to do things. They come running towards you. You're going to love this patient. It's only going to take 10 minutes. We'll be sorted out. <coughs> and, and you like helping them because they achieve really good things. They're lovely people. But every now and then, like your puppy dog, they piss in the wrong place or they do something bad. <laughs> You've got to yell. <laughs> but, and they probably feel the same about me. But I really enjoyed helping surgeons do things. Um, the first case is Richard Emery, and he was run out of town and he was run out of Australia. He was run out for no other reason than he was a competitor, he was different, he actually was doing things that weren't done in North Queensland. He was doing them exceptionally well, and doing operations in difficult areas causes you to get difficult problems. And if it happens, you happen to be a nice bloke, everybody goes, oh, isn't that sad about Peter, that terrible case that he has, he tried so hard. But whether it was Richard, it was because he's a bad doctor. Once you label a dog, puppy, whatever, as a bad dog, it's a bad dog forever. And it's a dreadful thing to be in. The sec um, and, and Richard had all those things done to him by APRA and his competitors. He went through audits from 2008 to 2013. Several audits, some done by myself. None of them actually showed him to be a bad doctor or a person that didn't cooperate. 
the thing about it was he lived in Townsville and the doctors that didn't want him there continued to complain. APRA didn't drive him out, but the misuse of APRA drove him out and drove him out of Australia. The anaesthetist I know uh, is now um, devastated. He had a major psychiatric illness during his practice. He did something wrong in a, in a deluded attempt to practice suicide. He self-reported to APRA on the advice of the psychiatrist. He didn't actually tell them the full story. He did self-report. The collusion of other anaesthetists in town had now have put him into a place where he lives like a hermit, he's uh, suicidal, and he's very unwell. <coughs> Myself, uh, as Director of Medical Services, I was attacked relentlessly for several things. One, I um, defended Richard's right to be treated fairly. Two, I wrote a letter as our previous Director of Medical Services talking today to colleagues, a confidential letter telling anaesthetists they weren't to leave the operating theatre for periods of 10 to 15 minutes with their patient anaesthetised. Where did I get the support from from that? It didn't come from the board or the executive of our hospital. I was told to find a workaround. So when I gave up my practice, I lost my anaesthetic practice, my intensive care practice, and I finished up doing locums. <clears throat> I'm a better doctor now than I ever was uh, because I actually realised that the cowardly thing that I did. Um, what's the problem? The problem is that if you actually look at it carefully, we have what's called a lack of transparency in our systems. We have an absence of balance. Lawyers call that justice. Uh, and actually... Each of us suffers moral injury. And in particular, the hospital I was working in was a Catholic hospital. Now, I'm not versed the Catholics, but I do remember what Brother Justice told us and Brother Valens and the others and why we were Catholics, because we had this internal conscience. When you see things go against your internal conscience, it's painful, and you realise you are a coward when you stand there and let it go past. In fact, I got to the stage where I couldn't actually work in a hospital that I worked for for 20 years because I realised the changes that were going on around me were to do with the derivation of income and not the protection of patients. And it was put to me by a senior member of the College of Surgeons that those doctors bring income and cost little. John, you cost a lot and you bring no income. You're not going to win that one. And another lawyer told me, you have a target on your back. So... You never put your head up above the trenches when they're shooting, so I got out. This person who wrote this book, Martin McCary, is, uh, you know, I recommend you to this book. Uh, he's from the United States. He's a professor of surgery at John Hopkins, and he wrote a book called Unaccountable. What hospitals won't tell you and how transparency can revolution health care. We love anonymity. We love discuss things in private. Uh, we can't be like that. And you wouldn't want it to be like that for yourself. And there's a picture of him. He's not actually very old. He's the person that set up the safe site surgery checklist that we all do before surgery and wants the one to happen after surgery so that we actually say, this happened during this case. This is what we're worried about for the future. And he actually has gone, undergone a lot of criticism. Medicine is competitive, but it is competing over all the wrong things. Medicine is its own culture, its own language, ethos, and code of justice. For every doctor who has called me as a traitor for writing this book, five have thanked me. That's why I believe that transparency time has come. I'm convinced he's right. So the thing about our system now, it's not accountable to our patients. It's accountable to trade unions, to colleges, to uh, associations. Um, and we'll hear about sham audit later on because we use surrogate measures. We audit the people we want to get rid of. We don't all participate in an equal form of audit. It's different if you're at the top of the stream. And we want an anonymity for our audits. As Director of Medical Services, the Medical Advisory Committee wanted me to be banned from attending any audit in the hospital. How can you be Director of Medical Services if you don't know what's going wrong? That, that, that to me, is the greatest shame ever, that we would want not to actually fix things and make it better. 
surgeons slam for phone to report rogues. Now, it would make you think that this chap was actually having a go at that we need more to mandatory reporting. But if you read in the paper what he actually said, this is a, a senior judge. Mr. Day, you said surgeons with competence issues should be given an opportunity for retraining, mentor supervision, or the option of ceasing to undertake procedures. And if the surgeon did not accept such options, referral to the medical board. You didn't go to the medical board and, and get taken off. You went and got help. So he's saying, we've got to help our colleagues. Senior surgeons who support systems to identify incompetence say they are stymied by self-interest of colleagues, a culture of not reporting, retribution, threats, and the unresponsiveness of slow and over-bureaucratic investigative and regulatory bodies, all of what we just heard about before. He told the surgeons the best way to determine a surgeon's competence was through objectively assessing the actual operation. In other words, auditing the whole lot of us, all together equally. Uh, he has a further article in the... Uh, he was involved in the Bundaberg crime. And he, and he said that we really don't have surgical audit and peer review because it doesn't attempt to measure objectively how competently or incompetently any surgeon has performed his actual operations. It's true of all specialists and all, all medicine. Most of us non-surgeons want us to audit to mean an examination by one person of another's performance. And he goes on and on about this thing that we actually don't do real audit. There's an unofficial communication network. I only talk about things I know happen to me. There's the discrete approach. John, you don't know what's going on. We know things that are happening to these patients that you don't know about. You've got to get rid of this guy. I just want to have a quick chat with you and talk to you about this. A private email between adversaries was leaked to me about how they intended to get rid of me. A, another senior doctor called me and he was off and said, John, they've got a plan and you will not win. The direct approach, your job is to run the effing whatever out of town. That was said to me by the, pre uh, the chairman of our medical advisory committee. If he uses that language, it's amazing. The threats, there are things you don't know about, you run the risk of being sued. Balance of that and natural justice, we assume the outcome, they assume the outcome, they know the outcome is going to support them. They use rumour, innuendo and denigration, they talk during operations about other doctors. And the nurses repeat it as if it's true. They do a single audit of someone. Of course, if you ordered me as an intensive care physician, one third of my decisions are wrong every day because I'm dealing with the unpredictable. And it can be made to look really bad if they don't like you. Uh, and then they repeat the audits over and over and over again. And you have to prove you're innocent. It's crazy. So I really believe there's this PTSD to your moral compass when you work in the uh, in organisations like this, you lose heart. You, you know, if you're a soldier and you see people being killed indiscriminately, you're upset. You get paralysis of action. Procedure always trumps common sense. You know, it, and you get the herd behaviour. The, the sheep on the outside of the herd gets attacked by the wolves. The herd moves away. If only they realised they turned around, they could trample the wolf to death.